I think in terms of the companies that will fare well are the ones that reflect what's going on, are the ones that kind of say, I know this is really tough. I know it, it's awful. And actually, I'm not sure how to communicate this. I'm not sure how to communicate this message. I want to tell you about this great thing, but I don't want to minimize what's going on because I think it's precisely that authenticity that's needed right now. Hi everyone, I am Pavlina Babaloka and I have with me today a very special guest. One of the world's most renowned and respected psychologists, Dr. Linda Babadopoulos. And we're gonna talk about how to deal with the effects of the COVID-19 crisis, both in our personal lives, our psychology, our mental state, and in our work and business. Dr. Linda is joining us today from the UK where she lives and works. Hi, Linda. Hi there. <laughs> but she's actually a Cypriot from Limassol, from where I live, which is where we met. Um, I don't know how many people know that you are actually a Cypriot. I guess, I guess the name is obviously... I think the name gives it away. <laughs> yeah, she's 100% uh, you know, Cypriot DNA. Before we dive into the questions, and as a, a proud Cypriot as well, because you're a Cypriot woman and, and you uh, have accomplished so much, I want to talk a little bit about your background. Because the past 20 years, you have been doing incredible work as a psychologist. So I want to introduce you to people who don't know exactly uh, what you do. Maybe they've heard your name. So you have been featured in most of the big media in the UK and in the US as well. And you wrote many books, including Unfollow, Whose Life Is It Anyway? I love this title. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Man Manual, Mirror, Mirror, Dr. Linda's Body Image Revolution, What Men Say, What Women Hear, so you deal with body image, relationships, uh, social media. You spoke at many events, including many uh, TEDx talks, and you delivered keynotes for organizations like Bloomberg, Women in Business, Save the Children, uh, so many keynotes. Uh, Dr. Linda has also worked uh, with a wide array of brands and corporate clients, and also private clients from pharmaceutical giants to women's uh, empowerment forums. So she has helped many large organizations through her consulting, uh, offering insight on consumer behavior, which is something I want to talk about today because it's totally shifting through this crisis. And you have your own podcast series, The Psychology Behind, uh, where you address issues and challenges society faces, offering evidence-based advice. So very trusted voice, very distinguished career uh, on and off screen, in academia, in, in the medical world, everywhere. So I couldn't think of a better person to bring here to talk about the effects of this crisis, both you know, mentally, psychologically, and uh, in business as well, because you have so many corporate clients. So thank you so much for being here. So first thing I want to ask you is that people have stress, anxiety, and fear under normal life conditions, right? And now we're dealing with a big global crisis, a big shift also in how we do things, um, how we do our everyday life. And how do we deal with all these changes so that it doesn't take a toll on our mental, emotional, and also physical health as well? because it's all about stress. And I guess my question is how to stay in a balanced emotional state every single day. I know what I do and it takes work, but I wanna hear what you have to say because most people, it's gonna be a roller coaster. The, the past, it has been a roller coaster and it's gonna be a con continuous roller coaster adjusting to this new reality. So how do we stay balanced every day? Look, I think there's a few things that, that people can do. I think the first is to recognize that um, as with anything in life, there's things that we can control and things that we can't. And in times of uncertainty, it's inevitable that you're going to just be drawn to focus on the things that are out of your control. You know, I kind of say about COVID, it's the holy trinity of anxiety. It's novel. We've never seen it before. And your brain is primed to look at novel threat. It's threatening. Again, your brain is primed to look for things um, that, that might harm you. And there's an uncertain outcome, you know, that we don't know what's going to happen. So 
all of these things, you know, if I was to write the, the perfect um, recipe for how to make someone feel anxious, it would be something like COVID. Having said that, though, I think those people that succeed in maintaining balance are those ones that do several things. I think the first one is to keep to routine. Now, routine helps for several reasons. When people come to see me clinically, one of the things I often ask, regardless of what they come with, are how are you eating, how are you sleeping, how are you moving? Now, these sound like very basic things, but actually, if you kind of think of our health and well-being as a pyramid, the very bottom of that pyramid, the kind of stuff that everything lies on, are these basics. So, you know, while during, you know, lockdown, it might be really tempting to sit in front of the TV all day eating nachos till three in the morning, you know, wake up at two in the afternoon, stay in the same clothes. And I get, you know, doing that for a couple of days. If that becomes your MO, it will disrupt everything. We know that physiologically, you respond poorly to poor sleep, you respond poorly to poor diet, you respond poorly to lack of motion. So all of those things are gonna feed in and make it difficult. So kind of having a routine, a basic routine around those self-care skills is key. But beyond that, from a, from a kind of deeper psychological point of view, we know that the thing that holds people in good stead is conscientiousness. So when we speak about routine, we're not just speaking about the content of what it means to sleep well or eat well or kind of separate work and life. We're speaking about the rhythm of showing up for yourself, of having that conscientiousness. I said I'm going to do this, so I'm going to do it. And we know, interestingly enough, that when someone goes through something very bad or even very good, sometimes they're thrown off course, right? Because you're blindsided. So even if you win the lottery, I've worked with people that have come into great fortune but feel horrible after because they've been thrown off course. So you need to stay on course. And I think with COVID, you know, as well as doing these three basics, I think there's also something fundamental and I'm sure, you know, you'll come on to it um, later as well with your questions around work. How do you separate work and life. We're all working from home. So how do I keep those boundaries? You know, how do I keep, you know, my, my five-year-old coming in and out? How do I keep sort of my husband, you know, making, I mean, all of a sudden, everything becomes um, kind of this, this sort of microcosm in this one or two little rooms that we spend time in. So all of these things about keeping routine, about keeping things separate, about maintaining conscientiousness are going to be key to kind of keeping you focused and moving forward. I have to say that I've been, I've been taking care of a lot of my health, my sleep, uh, everything you said about, uh, you know, resting, you said health and exercise. So I've been doing that every day, but I've been ha finding it hard to stay focused. Maybe I wanted to rest too much and then you're beating yourself up because you haven't been maybe as productive as you have wanted. For example, I see you have written so many books books and I haven't finished my first book and I'm like I have all this time at home why like how do I get myself to focus yes I'm eating healthy I'm exercising let's say I'm doing all that but still I go online every day I check the news I go you know I go to see what everyone is doing you know how many cases today and all this and that and how do you how do you keep that focus I, I guess that's a personal question I wanted to ask you because something I I believe I could be a lot more, I could get a lot more done in a day yeah. than what I am doing. Okay, so look, there's, again, there's a few things around motivation and keeping motivated. I think the first one is kind of having macro ambitions, but also micro ambitions. So for example, if a macro ambition <clears throat> is to write a book, hmm. that's great. I think it's about cutting it up into digestible pieces, right? And having realistic expectations of yourself. We know that people tend to give up when expectations are very unrealistic. So when I work with people who, I don't know, for example, they want to lose weight or they want to, you know, run a 5K. Well, if you sat on your sofa for the last, you know, year not moving, you're not going to get up and run five kilometers, right? Makes much more sense to feel good about walking around the block the next day walking around the block and a half and moving up. So I think you need to do two things. Number one, have a clear goal, but sometimes clear goals can be so far away that that motivation, it just, it, it's exhausting, right? So you then break it up. What are your micro ambitions today? It may be to brainstorm, you know, three chapters for the book. Brainstorm, what are the three ideas I have? The next day might be another three chapters. Once I sit down to write that first chapter, I break it up. So eventually it's broken up into manageable pieces. The second piece of advice that I'd give is focus on action rather than outcome. 
action rather than outcome. One of the biggest mistakes people make is they focus on the outcome. So again, to use a, a weight loss example, you know, I promised myself, you know, before the summer I'd lose, you know, X amount of weight and I step on the scales and it's, you know, it's not going down the way that I want it. And then I feel terrible. So I sit down and I, I eat unhealthily. I just, you know, decide I'm not going to work out. What's the point? Instead, validate yourself for today I woke up and I went to the gym. I did the right action. Today I woke up and I ate the healthy breakfast I said I would do. That's the thing I reward myself for. Because ultimately, if your actions are correct, then the outcome is correct. So being able to do that is key. And thirdly, and this is something I speak to my, my 17 year old daughter a lot, and, and you know, we always talk about taking care of your future self. So myself today would much rather kind of not do my work or not go to the gym or whatever. But, you know, this idea of what I do today has that impact tomorrow. So it, it, in many ways, and this is sort of very interesting psychologically. So my, uh, I did a, a master's degree in health and medical psychology. And one of the things that we used to do back in the day is sort of look at sort of changing health behaviors. And the interesting thing about any health behavior or business health or whatever kind of positive behavior is the, the benefits are long-term and the costs are immediate. So if you tell me to stop smoking, well, you know, I've got to like forego my cigarette now, forego my donut now, forego my fill in the blank now. And the benefit is maybe I have a few years of extra life or maybe, you know, I look better in a few months. It's too far away. So you switch that around. What can I bring now? How can I turn that on its head, right? So sometimes it's doing something very practical. And again, when it comes to your example of writing, the idea of just ticking something off a list. Right? I've made this list today and I'm going to tick it off. I know it sounds very benign, but actually in terms of validation, you know, in terms of the way that our kind of old chimp brain works, that idea, that tick. It's down into like really small pieces. Sometimes we compare and we think that person wrote a book in three months and there are people that have done books in three months and uh, it's taking me a year and more. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and there's comparison and then you feel not good enough and you feel I could be doing more and then you, know, you get Absolutely. on a downward spiral. And you shouldn't, I mean, again, it, it's a cliche, but it's true. You know, no, you know, you're really not in competition. Somebody else writing a book in three months, that's their book. It's got nothing to do with yours. And I think this idea, the sooner I think, and, and it's hard. And, you know, I think you and I have spoken about this before, right? The, you know, the big downside of social media is like everyone's life seems to be yeah. so much more beautiful. Of course, because it's PR. Social media is like, here I am. Here's the best version of me. No one sees all the stuff that goes behind. And actually, maybe your book is, you know, is written that way because it's more thoughtful. Maybe it's not just about churning it out. Maybe it is about the process. So kind of being kind to yourself. I know people really try and motivate themselves by being really horrible. We were doing some research um, recently with a, another company that I, I was consulting with, and we were finding it, it actually, while it kind of props you up in the beginning, it brings you down to berate yourself like that. So try not to. By all means, use people to inspire you, but I take it with a pinch of salt if anyone says they've written a book in three months. There's not that many out there. I want to I wanna go on social media because uh, you talk a lot about the negative effects of social media and body image and all of that. And I have seen the past couple of months because we had to, like people had to show up as real. Otherwise, it didn't make sense. Uh, people who were overly produced with video and perfect photo shoots, they couldn't do their perfect photo shoots anymore. So I've seen a little bit of a shift in how people show up and how some influencers show up and reinvent themselves. And, and I love that because some of the people I followed, they show up, showed up in a way that, in the real way that I expected. But do you think that this crisis is going to help us, uh, you know, overcome all this perfectionism on social media and just using it as a, you know, like you said, a PR tool? I have a PR background. That's why I teach social media because I understand it. You put an image out, you put a brand out. But do you think that this crisis is going to help us get more down to earth, become more humble, show up as more real online in the long term? Because in the short term, it, it is helping a little bit, some people. What is that's a really interesting question. Um, 
I do think that there's a lot of stock taking from people. I think I've been reading some really interesting, very reflective articles about what the world looks like after, you know, even the notion of what we thought we needed, what we thought we needed to look like, what we needed to buy, what we needed to be. I think all of a sudden, sort of, it's that Wizard of Oz moment, you know, where the curtains pulled back and you realize that, you know, so much of this is smoke and mirrors, right? The, the, you know, what we bought into. Um, having said that, as a psychologist, I know people have very short memories. <laughs> I know that sadly, um, you know, we, we often, um, things that feel really profound, simply because we need to be able to cope, you know, we forget them very easily. I do hope that the takeaways though, um, very much are the sense of community and, and this idea that there's, there's more to us than the eye. I mean, I, you know, one of the most, it gives me goosebumps every week. So in, in England, everyone comes out on a Thursday night to clap for all the medics that are helping. And it's just one of those sort of collective moments of recognizing that, that we're a lot more connected than we think. And, I, and many times, again, social media, simply because it is PR, has to be about the eye, has to be about my brand, my product, my idea. And so I've been seeing this more kind of collective reaching out and doing that. And I think hopefully that'll be something that changes. Hopefully our conversations around that change and we recognize that community ultimately is, is the only way forward. Mm. And, and yes, I see that as well, the community part. I hope that people are going to start showing up as more real after the crisis and not overly done and not you know, overly perfect image and more human. But um, I wanted to ask you about brands and businesses and business owners like me. Uh, most of us are small business owners and small brands. Uh, how do we communicate and, and sell because we need to sell in this environment where people get offended by everything. You, you're positive, they get offended. You place an ad, they get offended. Like I've seen so many comments online. So how do you communicate as a more empathetic brand and really connect to your audience and also be able to continue your business and sell during this time without uh, causing you know, different weird reactions because everyone's reacting so weirdly these days and it's overly sensitive, you know? Uh, I think, yeah. No, I think, I think the first thing is sort of recognizing that people are probably reacting because they're thinking through their emotions, right? So people are in this heightened stress state. They don't know what's going to happen. So probably, you know, a lot of these negative messages are a projection of what's going on internally. So I think the first thing is, you know, is to not kind of take it too much to heart because I think it's probably less about what they're seeing and more about the uncertainty that they're feeling. But I think in terms of the companies that will fare well are the ones that reflect what's going on, are the ones that kind of say, I know this is really tough. I know it, it's awful. And actually, I'm not sure how to communicate this. I'm not sure how to communicate this message. I want to tell you about this great thing, but I don't want to minimize what's going on because I think it's precisely that authenticity that's needed right now. I think companies that are, are a bit too kind of, well, let's pretend that it will all be great and back to normal. People, we don't know that. No one can say that. On the other hand, companies that become too much about the doom and gloom. Again, it, you know, it goes back to your point about balance. So what do we know for sure? Well, we know for sure on a very positive note that it's all hands on deck. As an academic myself, never in my lifetime have I seen literally millions of doctors, uh, researchers, biochemists, all working around, like uh, together, no ego. They're not saying, is my name gonna go first on this paper? Is my name gonna go second? So we will have a cure. What else do we know for sure? That our economy is in a mess. We know that right now. But what else you know, can, we, can we control right now? Well, we can control how we treat each other. We can control how we treat the uncertainty. So those companies that come up and kind of recognize, I know that you're probably struggling and that you're scared. And we are too. And here's some ideas. So this idea of almost, I always say this with couples, I tell companies this, when I hear couples arguing, sort of, you know, one partner's here, one partner's here, and the problem's in the middle and they're going at it, I often say, stand next to each other and put the problem in front of you and argue. And I think that's the same thing with companies. Stand next to your clients and kind of go, here's the thing. I don't really have the answers, but I'm going to stand next to you. I think we should do this. What do you think we should do? That's a very different dynamic, and I think that's something people will appreciate rather than being told or preached at or, or whatever. Mm, I love that. I think this is what people reject when 
you pretend that you know all the answers and I'm going to be positive and everything is going to be great and it's not great. Um, so there's, there's a very fine balance there. And also people are finding it difficult uh, with regards to voicing their opinions online. They're afraid to voice opinions because everyone has opinions these days and they think they're going to get attacked. There is a certain way to post online, I believe, so that uh, you voice your opinion, but you don't offend anyone. How, how do we do that? How do we voice our opinions, even as individuals, so that we don't offend each other and get into arguments, which you see online a lot these days. Conspiracy theories, isn't that everyone has their own opinion about what's going on. How do we keep that balance uh, with regards to our posts on social media? Do we stop posting and uh, ignore? I'm doing a gratitude challenge. I'm posting every day what I'm grateful for mm -hmm. because I was a little bit tired of getting weird comments under anything I posted. So I'm posting like all, everything I'm grateful for. But what is, what is your view? How, how can we post online? Well, look, my view is you're never going to please all the people all the time. Mm -hmm. I think the minute you post, you need to accept that someone out there, of course, is not going to like it. And that's okay. You know, I think, I, you know, I'm a big believer in, you know, taking on constructive criticism. I think constructive criticism is awesome. That's the only way we grow, to look in a mirror that someone else holds up and go, geez, I didn't see that. I'm a big believer in <laughs> ignoring just right out malicious criticism that's not about what you're doing that's about someone else so i think being able to discriminate between someone going you know paulina you know when you said this i thought you could have said, you know had you said that i think it would have been more useful and maybe next step which maybe you can sit back and go oh, i can learn something from this and grow that's very different to i hate that you know you've posted this and i hate you or i hate life or whatever that's like Okay, I mean, I just, I simply wouldn't put fire on that. I and mean, we did a big campaign over here because this was a big issue sort of politically as well. And you kind of have sort of far right, far left groups kind of attacking people. And they, they actually amplify a very negative message by kind of hooking on to well-known media people, right? So you engaging in very sort of negative trolling is not going to help anyone, right? So it really, it's just going to amplify the message. On the other hand, I certainly think I'm a huge proponent of free speech, huge. And I think by all means, if it's a conversation worth having, have it. I have to say though, I think it's also about the form. I am not sure you can have a meaningful discussion in 160 characters or less. You know, I'm a shrink, <laughs> we use a lot more words. So I think you can get the gist of an idea out there. But when it starts kind you of- You can get misunderstood if you try to say something with few words and then you try to explain the comments and then it gets yeah, you need to kind of also be aware, like, I, you know, again, someone like yourself who sort of does this and does this brilliantly, um, but also it's inevitable. One of my, my favorite Aristotle quotes was, if you, if you don't want people to criticize you, you know, say nothing, do nothing, be nothing. Be nothing. Yeah, this is what I tell my clients. Uh, we had a session on content the other day, and I said, you know, if you try to uh, get everyone to like you and to not polarize, you're going to disappear online if you try to just please everyone. Uh, and, and it's okay to polarize people as long as you do it tactfully in the right way, with compassion, with empathy about what everyone is going on, what everyone is going through, and not really directly attacking a certain group of people. I believe there is a way to do that. And you're right, it's freedom of speech. And we should all be free to voice uh, you know, our, our opinions. But I, I think we all need a lot more training on how to do that uh, you know, in the right way. I guess video helps a lot. That's why I do a lot of video, because you can talk more, like you said. Um, I want to talk about, I want to ask you about consumer behavior, how it's going to change because we are on social media and talking about business um, for people who have businesses, either large corporations or small. Um, I think consumer behavior is going to change. I want your view as a psychologist. Um, how is it going to change? Is it going to change for good? And what do businesses need to have in mind in order to succeed in the next few months and the new environment? Yeah, I think there, um, so again, if you kind of look at historically what tends to happen sort of after crises, um, 
I think the difference, I think usually you kind of find that when people are anxious, they tend to become safe by kind of going inward, right? So what do we do when we're stressed? We make our lives smaller, which means we buy less, we travel less, we go out less, right? So there's something about this retraction, right, that happens. Now, interestingly enough, I think my big worry is this. Um, as you were saying earlier, I do a lot of work on, on a sort of the, the online world. <clears throat> and psychology, sociology, what's going on. I think there's been a big threat for, for many years. It's been coming, it's unavoidable, that a lot of jobs will be taken over by AI. And I'm not just talking, obviously, blue collar jobs. I think increasingly now we're going to see sort of, you know, people that are in everything from law to accounting to even medicine, right? So that their jobs are going to be taken over by AI. Because of COVID, Right now, you have now expedited what would have taken, I would say, easily 10 years. Things like teaching online, things like, you know, you know courses, but things like buying online, things like medics online, all of this stuff, which would have taken years of trial error, has been fast forwarded. Companies have downsized. You know, they, you know, uh, 12,000 gone from several airlines that other week, you know, constantly, you're hearing it everywhere. I really doubt that, you know, that people are going to take back um, employees. You know, back in the day, as a company grew, their employees grew. These days, it's not the same thing. You know, a company can grow, can have a bigger balance sheet with fewer and fewer employees because of AI. So we're going to, I think, see a lot of disharmony. I think there's going to be uh, not just a, a recession or a depression people are talking about, there's going to be a lack of a sense of purpose because of so many jobs leaving. So you know, companies that are facing now in this situation, I think need to be very pro-social, pro-human. They need to be seen as companies that understand this and they can show it in a couple of ways, how they value their employees. I think governments are actually going to have to step in and make sure people have jobs at some point because I think it's so easy to outsource them. And, and then what do you do? What do you do with a generation of people what are they going to Netflix and chill all day long? What's going to happen? You know, is everyone going to become an entrepreneur? Like what, you know, what are people in? Yeah. Yeah. Is that what happens? Because I'm not sure that is. I think again, for a lot of people, it'll be much easier to just do nothing. So, so what, you know, this, you know, this whole era that we're entering in is not just a big question mark for corporations. I think it's a big question mark for society as a whole, but kind of in the interim, if you want my honest opinion about who will survive, it's those that are most adaptable. And to me, adaptability, at this point means empathizing with that understanding that your consumer now is very anxious about their place in society so their idea of engaging with you and your product needs to come from a place that you get that you can somehow pass on that sense of my understanding whether that means i'm making it easier for you to engage with my company um in in, in terms of how much you spend or how much time you spend or what i give you then you know that that has to be key mm. It's, it's quite a bit weird. Yes, I do see a trend towards entrepreneurship, but it doesn't mean that everyone will make it. It has been a trend. It has been seen as cool, but it's really not cool. It takes a lot of work. And, and in every crisis, there is an opportunity. So some people, some people in business are going to make a lot of money and some people are going to suffer. And, and one of my mottos is that in every crisis, there is an opportunity there. And you need to find that opportunity what do you think the opportunity is for us as humans or as businesses maybe in this crisis? Do you see something that is shifting and it's going to improve the world? It's going to be an opportunity. Yeah, for sure. Look, I think, I think we're going to make huge advancements, um, you know, in terms of medically what we know, not just about COVID, but I think the way that we approach uh, proactive medicine rather than reactive, I think it's going to be huge. I think it's going to be huge, not just in terms of physical health, but mental health as well. I think that those trends, I think, you know, again, adaptability, you know, there's going to be the fact that we can't go to restaurants now, there's going to be a shift. There's going to be a shift maybe of people coming in and cooking in our homes and finding different ways because people still need to connect. And I think those entrepreneurs that kind of, you know, or those businesses that can adapt and think about this. Creative. 
Yes, get creative. Well, I, mean, absolutely. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities in terms of connection. You know, there's all those funny videos online about how Zoom calls end up working where like, you know, people are stopping and starting and look, it's the best we have now. But I think, you know, companies like Zoom and Skype will create more and hopefully there'll be some newcomers in that teach us how to connect. You know, it used to be that the online world felt, you know, a bit weird connecting. Well, now we've realized we can literally do everything by not moving from our screens. We can eat, we can you know connect we can fall in love we can do business but I think there's a lot of scope for some you know bright minds to come in and kind of say have you thought about doing it like this so I absolutely think that there's that there's scope but I do also think that we need to value humanity and human input and not just the bottom line when it comes to money because if that's the goal right and that often is we know for companies that often is um, then it then just turns into a race to the bottom, right? A race to making so much more, it becomes a race to the bottom because ultimately most of this stuff can become digitized very soon. Well, let's talk about money then because it's, it's the biggest thing on everyone's mind mm -hmm. right now. And we need to, to make money to have a certain lifestyle, you know, even to keep our home going and our electricity bills and, you know, the basic things and go to the supermarket. So there is a lot of worry and insecurity. Literally every Zoom call I've been on, every webinar, every uh, live I've seen, everyone is talking about fina finances and this fear. Um, whether you have a job and you don't know if you're going to keep it, whether you lost your job, whether you have a business. And I've seen people with a lot of wealth who have felt like they're losing their status and they've been reacting like really negative online. So I've seen all kinds of people um, feeling this fear, this insecurity, even reacting like so many with negativity online on their posts and fear. Uh, so I've experienced a little bit of that because we had a bank crash in Cyprus in 2013. Many people lost their life savings overnight. They got depressed. Some people got sick you know, and even died. Maybe somebody had cancer or a heart attack, but it was because of that stress. And, um, and I feel it's, it's going to be a part of people that, of the population that are going to fall into that depression. So how do we keep ourselves from getting influence from that financial uncertainty and what it's causing? Uh, how do we stop ourselves from being in this fear mode all the time about money? It's going to happen with money. That's a big one, I think, for everyone. Yeah, it is. Um, and again, we know that uh, finances are a big cause of mental health issues. We know that finances are a big cause of, of problems within the family and the infrastructure. So we know, you know, this lockdown, while it's been wonderful for you know, physical health, I think, you know, the economic fallout is the other side of the coin for physical and mental health. We know that... Uh, your economic status has a huge impact on on your well-being, both mental and physical. So it is a genuine concern, a genuine worry. And this kind of goes back to my point about, I think, a, a couple of things have to happen. So I think number one is perspective. So I, I, you raise an interesting point that people sometimes aren't anxious about kind of loss of money, but loss of status, right? So I think kind of challenging that if you're in the situation where actually maybe I'm not on whatever rich list, but actually I can feed my family, things are okay. You know, maybe I can't go on X amount of holidays a year, but I can, you know, still be all right. It's something about perspective, about keeping, you know, side of what's important. And that's not to say you lose your ambition, you don't go, but it's okay to, to just hit pause sometimes, especially with what's happening in the world right now. But the second thing is people that are genuinely having problems that they, you know, people that are living paycheck to paycheck. And look, we see this perhaps not in Cyprus, but you look around in big countries like the States and you see that this is a huge, huge problem. And this goes back to my original point about we need to pull together and there needs to be a sense of community and people watching out for each other because, you know, uh, there but for the grace of God like, you know we don't do this alone you know this this can't happen alone so I think sort of um having people lobby government to ensure that certain jobs 
are kept safe, right? That there is a safety net for people is going to be key. We know that, you know, things like violence in the family have increased hugely. We know that financial problems have a huge impact on that. About the, you know, the help people seek, it's, it's a big issue and it's in no one's interest to have one part of society doing really well and then everyone else doing really badly. You know, we need to kind of work together. And, and I think, again, just draw on the lessons of this pandemic of anything good's come of it. You know, you know, the idea of like, you know, the butterfly effect, right? The idea that something happened possibly with a bat in China means that my, you know, store in London closed. That shows how connected we are. So we, we need to use that to go upwards rather than go downwards. Yeah, to be there for each other and those who have more get together, give to those who have less and, and the idea of community. I think that's a big shift in consciousness. If we can manage that and if we can distribute the wealth more evenly, everyone can be okay. It's in everyone's interest. I think this idea that it's not, and look, you know, again, it's not about being sort of, you know, anti sort of people progressing and, and being entrepreneurs. I think it's wonderful. I think people should be propped up and, you know, we should have, you know, sort of, you know, merit warranted, but actually there has to come a point where you realize that if it just goes in one direction to that extent, that it will affect everyone. Like, you know, this, this notion that you can just look after yourself, I think has really been, I don't know. Um, yeah. There's been challenging what's happened. Well, I love that shift uh, now that it's happening now, realizing that we're all connected. And if we all take it to heart and really realize that, it's, we're going to come out with a much better world. Um, I want to ask uh, how has this crisis affected Dr. Linda on a personal level? <laughs> like, um, have you had some realizations? Has your life shifted uh, emotionally how have you been <laughs> um it would, be, it would be great to know from like you personally how you have been dealing with that yeah so for me so i guess a lot of my work so i've been we've been in lockdown i've been to the bbc a couple of times but every other tv thing i do I do like this. Um, I gave a big talk the other week to a few hundred people like this, you know, my clients I see online. So, you know, in many ways, sort of um, my work sort of continued. Um, but, I, you know, I, I'm, you know, I guess in some ways I've been lucky. We've, we're allowed to have these walks a day and I'm the least, I don't know if you know, anyone knows me, I hate working out. I hate kind of, I hate moving and I try to, even though I kind of preach about it, but all of a sudden I love these walks. You know, I look forward to once a day, this becomes my thing that I get to go out and look at the trees and sort of, you know, smell the flowers. And that's been interesting to me because I, that's not the, you know, that's been a realization that the things that you value can shift sort of very clearly. I'm loving having, um, so my husband and daughter are both working from home. My daughter's doing online. So we have um, our little thing that we set up in terms of, you know, we have our lunch at the same time, which of course we never did, which has been quite sweet. Um, I'm not as bad a cook as I thought. I'm not a good cook, but I, you know, but it's, it's gotten better, which is great. Um, I think overall, the thing that's breaking my heart the more than anything is I'm missing my parents. My parents are in Cyprus. We should have been there. We couldn't go because of the lockdown. I'm an only child. I miss them so much. And that I'm finding really hard. You know, really. I think I, I have a suspicion this is going to be a good thing for you because I remember it was exactly one year ago we met. And you told me, I want to spend more time in Cyprus, but all my work is in the UK. But now if you can do everything online, there is no excuse. It's like somebody invites you in a conference, it's going to be online. Somebody invites you to me, you can just go live from Cyprus. So problem solved. So uh, I think this adjustment, it, it, I feel it's going to be good for a lot of people who had this excuse that I have to drive somewhere, I have to be somewhere. Absolutely. Amazing. People are going to move where they really want to live, maybe yeah. like in nature and they don't need to be in big cities. So yeah. we, we hope to have you more in Cyprus. <laughs> I to be able to come where I really do. I really do. Um, a last uh, question about people who have kids, because you're an expert on that as well. And uh, how, how do we, I mean, the kids now, I have a niece and a nephew, I don't have my own. My nephew is five, my niece is eight. Uh, how do we keep this experience, the lockdown and the post-lockdown? My, my niece went to school yesterday 
and they have to keep distance. How do we keep these, all these from becoming a traumatic experience for them and make it like fun? And is there a way to make it fun and interesting and educational? And Look, I think the first and foremost is to kind of, you need to speak to kids. Of course, it has to be age appropriate, right? Because if you don't, kids will often make up reasons for things themselves, right? So parents have told me that their kids would be like, oh, is it because I didn't wash my hands properly? Is that why, you know, grandma's sick? Or is like, did I, you know? So being really clear about, you know, in a really simple way that this is what's happening, but also when you explain the problem, offer them something to hold on to that they can control. So we have this illness and, you know, everyone's trying to fix it. But in the meantime, we know that what's really helpful is washing your hands, you know, wearing a mask, socially distancing, whatever that is. The other thing is you need to recognize that I think children, um, children show unhappiness in different ways. Sometimes it's not the loudest kid that's crying that's the unhappiness. It's the one that's quiet and withdraws. So I, as a parent, I would keep an eye on any changes, right? Because what you might see is kids regressing. You might see kids wanting to cuddle with you more or, or even wetting the bed. So any changes like that, make sure you check in with them. And check in often and just provide that sense of 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 control and of, you know, things are going to be okay. Don't forget, kids are amazing at picking up what you're feeling. So model that behavior, model that it's going to be okay. And you know what? It's okay to be sad. That's fine. We talk about it and we cry, but then we remember that this is what we're going to do. So if they see that coming from you, it's key. You're reminding me of a video I saw the other day. It was very sad. But this father from the U.S. was describing how his son, 12 years old, he thought everything was okay. He was in his uh, room gaming playing games he bought him the screen and everything and how they didn't realize that something was going on because psychologically he not look normal but the, the the child killed himself uh hung himself yes 12 years old and he was telling the story and how everything was normal so what you're saying some kids they might regress they might talk less and and we should notice that as well they might not express what is going on well, yeah, and, and depending on their age, they express in different ways. So I always say to parents, look for differences. Just look for shifts, you know, and clock them and kind of be there. And again, this idea of, you know, checking in, you know, um, and kids aren't great. It's also, I always say to parents this, you know, if you ask a closed-ended question, you know, how was your day good? Like everyone knows when you pick them up from school, they don't want to talk. <laughs> so find your moment, you know, so whether it's bedtime, so when you're kind of lying down together and they're more relaxed. Or I often think when you're in the back of the car and it's not that face-to-face, eye-to-eye, and, the, you know, that often helps them sort of open up. But just sort of, you know, find your rhythm. Eating together as a family, I think, is a wonderful way, again, of clocking it. And, you know, one of the things... That, you know, we've always done with my family, sort of, when we sat down, I would always say, okay, what was the best thing that happened today to everyone? Everyone goes around. And it's just a, an easy way to show gratitude, but also to prime your mind to look for something. So even if you've had the worst day ever, and we're going to talk about that too, what was the best thing about today? And I think that's an, often a really useful intro even to, into the worst things. Mm. Okay, so... Uh, as we're coming, as we're wrapping up, because I know you have your appointments and you're really busy, um, what is one message you want to give to everyone about this post-crisis uh, life and environment and how to navigate it successfully? Look, I guess all I can say is having done this job for a long time, kind of the thing that I've seen that really helps people get through life more than anything else is adaptability. So, you know, know that you're stronger than you are. Know that you, you know, you, you can do this and you, you can adapt. And, you know, all this idea that, you know, that things have to be the way they were, don't necessarily stick to that, you know. Be open. Be open to, to kind of a new way of thinking about things and doing things. And, and I think ultimately sort of connect. That will that, be the thing that gets us through. Mm. Okay, and, and for people who want to connect with you or for corporations or for organizations or for governments, who do you work with uh, at this time? And um, how do they connect with you? How do they find you if they want to work with you? Um, so uh, they can, 
uh, the details of my uh, the people that support me so my, my agents are all on my website drlinda.com so any sort of press and media queries can go through there but I also have Twitter and Instagram and if you kind of send me a message through there then I'll make sure to either uh, respond directly or make sure somebody connects with you so we can set up a time to chat so you work with individuals you work with couples you work with businesses you work with ch children as well right well, with children, I tend to do a lot with, yeah, the, sort of the, a lot of research with the online world and, yeah, mm -hmm. and kind of mental health things. Okay, great. So, drlinda.com, they can find your books there as well. drlinda.co.uk. .co.uk. Yeah, and they can find my books there, all, like, there's lots of media stuff and all the details of how to get in contact. And, of course, on Amazon, I guess your books are all on Amazon as well, if you're shopping on Amazon. So, so go check the books out. Thank you so much uh, for your time and uh, for everything that you do, all this amazing work. And I think it's going to be even more important at this time for people like you to come and speak out because uh, you're not just speaking to speak. You know, you're speaking from all these years of work and research and experience and working with people. So um, I think it's going to be a time when there's going to be a much bigger need for people like you to keep us balanced. So thank you so much for your time, your energy. And uh, yeah, hope to see you in person again soon uh, when <laughs> all of this is over. Uh, we have the beautiful Sailor's Rest here. They opened yesterday uh, at Sedra Fire Marine. I'm, I'm right next to it. I, I live right next to it. So <laughs> it's nice and quiet and plenty of space between the tables. So <laughs> <laughs> Nice socially distancing. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, stay safe and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Hey, this is Pablina. Thank you for watching this interview with Dr. Linda Babadopoulos. If you enjoyed this interview, make sure you subscribe here on my YouTube channel to stay informed about all my new videos and interviews with world-class experts and authorities on mindset, entrepreneurship, business, health and wellness, everything you need to thrive under any conditions in life and in business. And make sure you check out my other interviews here with other experts, which uh, I'm sure you're gonna find very insightful and useful. Thank you for joining and see you next time.